Good morning. Welcome to the second symposium of the 30th anniversary academic sessions of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. I'm Professor Chamila Mehtananda from the Department of Pharmacology from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all who have joined this symposium, both in person and online. So the topic for today is developing and implementing guidelines appropriate for the local healthcare systems, which is an important topic for Sri Lankans. We have three eminent speakers lined up for this session. They will be talking on three different aspects of the same topic. So they'll be talking on how to move from evidence to decisions and how to develop and implement guidelines and how to adapt clinical practice guidelines to our setup. Uh, we will have the three talks at the beginning and we will take up the questions at the end and you can send in your questions through the chat box. So without further ado, I'm going to move to the first talk. So the first speaker is Professor Pratap Tharia who is an adjunct professor at the Clinical Epidemiology Unit of the Christian Medical School, Vello, India. He was the founding director of the Cochrane South Asia Network Center. He is also a systematic review author and former editor of the Cochrane Schizophrenia Group. So Professor Tharian will talk on using grade to facilitate moving from evidence to decisions. Over to you, Professor Tarian. Good morning. Let me first felicit felicitate all of you on your 30th anniversary celebrations of the Faculty of Medicine at the uh, University of Kalania. I am indeed grateful to Prashantha for inviting Joseph, Matthew, and myself to help you in this symposium on developing uh, guidelines appropriate for local healthcare systems. And I'll start off by helping you to understand how to use the grade approach to facilitate moving from evidence to decisions. But let's start with a little bit of a reality check. How useful do you think guidelines actually are? Well, I guess it depends on the guideline, how it was developed, who developed it, and who it is meant to benefit. But the bottom line is, unless the guideline is informed by reliable and updated evidence, it could actually prove to be harmful. And I'd like to use an illustrative example here, where a group of people check to see whether the evidence from ongoing trials was actually being reflected in guidelines. And they found that the cumulative evidence of benefit of using streptokinase to prevent death due to acute myocardial infarction was actually available from 1973. However, the existing guidelines, which are like the textbook recommendations, started recognizing this research input only in the mid to late 1980s. Meanwhile, what they actually were recommending was prophylactic lidocaine for acute myocardial infarction late into the 90s when there was cumulative evidence of no benefit for prophylactic lidocaine from as early as 1970s. So this illustrates the need to have reliable evidence in your guidelines in order to prevent harmful outcomes. The other important point is the processes by which important bodies make guidelines. And the example I'm going to use is from the WHO uh, with, uh, guidelines, which was reviewed by Andy Oxman and his colleagues from the Nordic Cochrane Center, published in The Lancet in 2007, where it showed that interviews with department directors at the WHO headquarters to see what is the process and what kind of evidence goes into WHO guidelines reveals that most often these recommendations were not developed based on systematic reviews or any evidence, but rather than by expert consensus. And often there were no experts in methodological areas or even representatives for whom the guidelines were meant for involved in the process. 
The third problem with these guidelines is conflicts of interest among guideline developers. And the example I can give you is the Eli Lilly practice guidelines in a marketing campaign, all paid for by themselves, to ensure that one of their products will go into the guidelines and will become performance standards, packages of care, bundles of care, all paid for by Eli Lilly. However, the Infectious Disease Society of India took some of the you know, emerging evidence which suggested that this could be a harmful practice and did not actually endorse these guidelines. But it was too late because by then, lots of money had been made and many people had been treated with these guidelines. So essentially, it means that every society and any group involved in making guidelines should have a consistent and transparent process which is robust and rates these guidelines for how good they are. And they should have a policy to ensure they can deal with all the conflicts of interest. Because very often these academic and commercial conflicts of interest masquerade as evidence-based medicine. So what we need are processes which are structured and transparent, which are evidence-informed and rigorous, and which are independent of academic and commercial conflicts and are representative of the stakeholders who are going to use these guidelines. This is a process of development. The Institute of Medicine said that to be trustworthy, a guideline should be based on a systematic review of the existing evidence. It should have a knowledgeable multidisciplinary panel of experts and representatives who actually consider all the uh, patient important outcomes and preferences and have an explicit and transparent process to minimize bias and conflicts of interest and eventually provide you with guidelines which rate both the certainty or the confidence they have in those estimates of effects and how strongly they recommend or don't recommend the guidelines, the recommendation, and which should be revised as appropriate when evidence emerges. So in effect, what you're trying to say is that when you are in a low or a middle-income country when there is a constraint on financial resources and there are numerous competing priorities, it is extremely important that any recommendation aimed at improving health outcomes should have an evidence footprint accompanying it. So moving from evidence to a policy is a two-step process. The first step involves sifting through all that passes as research evidence to be sure that you get the kind of evidence that you need to develop a summary of findings from a systematic review. It can then be used by a group of guideline developers using the grade process to see should we use the evidence and in what context should we use it. Now the grade working group provides you an online platform, a software platform to do both steps of the process. And you can read more about the grade working group from their website, which is on the top, and the gradepro.org website gives you access to the actual software to do this. You can log in and create an account and use all the resources there to follow exactly what we're discussing this morning. Now, the first step, how do you get the evidence straight and summarize the evidence from a systematic review to create evidence profiles? So what happens when you have a systematic review to be confident of the results of the review, we need to know for all the outcomes that you consider important, clinically important, what is the magnitude of benefit and is it likely to be clinically useful, not statistically significant, but clinically useful? And how confident are we that these results are likely to be true estimates and they are likely to be seen in routine clinical practice and that further research will not change these estimates? That give you the kind of information you want to be sure of what you want to recommend. So you first start out by deciding what are the outcomes that you consider critical to make a decision or important even though it's not critical. And these are the kind of outcomes that you would include in your summary of findings table. So if you're comparing one intervention versus another, that's a comparison. And for each comparison, you need to end up with a summary of findings table which has used a maximum of seven clinically important outcomes and presents these outcomes 
with the combined results from all the trials in terms of the pooled relative estimates like relative risks or odds ratios to their confidence intervals, as well as the absolute benefits with each, what is the risk difference with the interventions with their 95% confidence intervals. And then each of these numerical estimates need to be accompanied by, accompanied by your judgment about how confident you are in that result that is likely to be the true result. So in rating the importance of the outcomes, it depends on the condition and the kind of intervention you're looking at. So for viral pneumonia with high mortality, you could consider the outcomes critical for decision making, mortality, hospital admission, pneumonia, and less important, but still important enough for you to consider in the evidence summary for the neurological complications. And it would change from intervention to condition, condition and intervention. But what you're interested in is not including surrogate outcomes, which are not the actual outcomes you're interested in, because it's very common in trials of health trial of healthcare interventions to see people measuring outcomes which are considered to be uh, statistically significantly different in one group over the other, when actually what a patient important outcome is a clinical symptom, a clinical outcome. So there are many situations where we use proxy indicators for a surrogate outcome, often a blood test or an imaging finding or a physiological finding rather than the actual clinical endpoint that people are trying to prevent when they treat all these conditions. So the process in the systematic review is to actually define the outcomes in your PQ statement, find the studies which fulfill your inclusion criteria, extract the data from these outcomes, assess the risk of bias in all these studies, understand the characteristics of these studies, and then summarize the results of a meta-analysis and evidence profile, which not only presents the numerical estimates, but also gives you the judgment of how confident you are in these estimates. So the confidence in the results for any outcome depends on many aspects. The first is, can we trust the evidence? Are the studies that gave you data for that outcome, are they done well, or is it likely they could have been biased? If so, how much is that bias in each trial contributing to not being confident of the overall result? That's the first thing you look at. Then you look to see, do the, does the evidence actually apply directly to my setting? Because the population studied, the comparisons, the outcomes, the health systems are all exactly what I would use. Or have you left out bits or use differences, which give me an idea that's indirect evidence. The third is, the overall results of the studies, of the pooled analysis, are the individual trials results consistent with the pooled result? If not, how can you explain this heterogeneity or the inconsistency in the results? Because if you cannot, then your confidence in the pooled estimate is reduced. Then you want to know, are the results precise? By which I mean, do they create confusion in your mind on should you or should you not be using it? If you find that at, what, at the upper end of the confidence interval, you're very sure you use it, but at the lower end of the confidence interval, you're either saying, I will not use it, or I'm not very sure whether it's going to be only a marginal benefit that creates imprecision. The next thing you also want to know is, do you have enough people and events in that, for that outcome to be sure the results will not be updated by another trial? And finally, you want to make sure that you actually have all the evidence and not evidence from a bias sample, which is easily accessible. So based on these criteria, you start looking at the evidence. And if the evidence comes from randomized control trials, they consider to be high certainty evidence, but your confidence in those results can be reduced for any of these, on any of these domains. You can reduce your confidence by one level from high to moderate, or by two levels from high to moderate to low. And you do this for every outcome. Now, you can also grade the evidence from observation study, which because of the potential for selection bias, they start as low certainty evidence. And if there are any other problems in the way those studies were done, your confidence in their results is reduced even further. But if they're done very well, a good cohort study, 
to give you confidence that this is actually something that works, particularly if the effect is very large magnitude of effect, like a, a risk ratio of two or five or a risk reduction to the point of saying it's 0.5, 50% reduction in the risk or an 80%, 0.2, 80% reduction in the risk. Then you can say, even though there could be some confounding here, it's unlikely that this is, result is really not true. So you have more confidence in this, even though it's from observational studies, and you upgrade your confidence in the intervals. Similarly, if there were confounders in the trials, but if those confounders have not been there, the intervention may have done had a better effect, would be another reason for you to upgrade your confidence in the results. Also, if you find that across the body of evidence, there is a clear dose-response relationship between the amount of intervention and the outcomes, that can also give you some confidence that you're this is likely to be a true effect. So you end up then with four levels of certainty or uncertainty, which tells you that if you have not downgraded the evidence for any of those domains, you can say you're very confident that this is the true effect and further research is not likely to change this. So you can say this drug will do this. If you have downgraded, then you are introducing some doubt and you say it probably won't do that. And depending on how much you downgrade, you get less and less certainty. You may say it may do this, or we are not very sure. It's very unclear what the effects of these interventions are. Now, this is done for every outcome, for each outcome, and reflects your confidence in the body of evidence across all the trials within that outcome. So now we move to the next step where we try and see how can we use the evidence from systematic review to frame recommendations for or against the intervention. What's the grade process involved in this? So what then happens is that the guideline development group will look for a systematic review which addresses the question they're interested in. They'll try and see if there's a summary of findings table and use that, or they'll make their own summary of findings table, following the process we follow. Then they look at the overall certainty of evidence across all the critical domains to decide on what is the overall quality of evidence. And then they look at uh, the balance of benefits, harms, costs, benefits, preferences across whatever available evidence there is to formulate a recommendation for or against the intervention and make their recommendation, which could be a strong recommendation, which would say we recommend using this or it could be a conditional recommendation saying we suggest using it, or recommend against using or suggest against using it. And it will be accompanied by the confidence they have in the overall results. So this is how guideline panels ideally would use evidence to make a decision. And there are implications for a strong and a conditional recommendation. A strong recommendation implies that most people would have no doubts about using this. Some people might, but in general, Clinicians don't have to worry too much about making the recommendation because most people would take it. And policymakers can clearly make a strong recommendation and hope that most people would use it. Conditional recommendations introduce some degree of uncertainty about what patients' preferences might be because it might involve a lot more harms than benefits. So younger people might not worry about the harms. The older people may not want the harms or the burdens. Costs may determine various things. The clinicians then need to be prepared to sit with patients and explain the pros and cons and help them to make the decision. Let's take an example. One I use very often is this example from the guide, WHO guidelines for the treatment of malaria, when uh, where it clearly says that intravenous artisanate should be used in preference to quinine for the treatment of severe falciparum malaria in adults. A strong recommendation based on high certainty or high quality evidence. This came from a systematic, a Cochrane systematic review, where they found two, six trials at that time, looking at the outcome of death, which shows how many people died with artisanal, how many people died with quinine, and the risk ratio for each of those trials for the comparison. And this is the graphic description of the risk ratio against the vertical line of no difference. The blue uh, center squares uh, represent the risk ratio and the horizontal lines represent the width of the confidence interval, which if it crosses the line of no difference means it's an uncertain result. And if it doesn't cross the line of no dis difference, it means it either helps or harm. And the directional effect is shown in the graph. 
The other thing to keep in mind is that the size of the blob of that thing reflects how much weight that study's data contributed to in the overall pooled analysis. And it shows that the study by Dundalk carried 73% of the weight of to contributing to the final result, which was favoring artisanate. And it showed that if you use artisanate, it reduces the risk of death by 1 minus 0.62, which is 0.38, or a 38% reduction in the risk of dying. The best estimate is 49%, and the least estimate is at least 25% reduction in the risk of death. The absolute difference was 84 fewer deaths per thousand from 56 to 109 fewer. And you could also say that we would need to treat 12 people with artisanate compared to quinine to prevent one death due to severe false epidemiology anywhere from nine to eight, which is pretty good. So you could say, okay, this is an effective intervention. Let's recommend it. But that's when the grade process comes in. Because we want to know how confident are we in that estimate. So then we go through this process and looking at the risk of bias in the studies, assessing inconsistency, these five factors. And then you can come up with an evidence summary. And this one says, the WHO summary says, for the outcome of death, they found six randomized trials with no serious limitations, no serious inconsistency, no serious indirectness, no serious imprecision, and it gives you the risk difference, 13% and 22% deaths with artisanate and quinine, the relative risks, the absolute differences, and concludes that this is high certainty evidence for a critical outcome. The next, for neurological discharge, there's only data from two trials which measured that outcome. And the overall evidence was very low certainty, showing they can't be sure whether there is no difference because relatively suggests there's no difference between the two. But it was very low certainty because there was serious indirectness and very serious imprecision. And then the other two outcomes also, they gave you a great certainty level. Based on this, they gave you a justification for their strong recommendation and high quality evidence saying that there's a significant reduction in the risk of death with artisanate, is high certainty evidence. And there is, a, there is low certainty evidence, but it's associated with a lower risk of hypoglycemia, favoring artisanate, and no difference in neurological sequelae. And because of that, as well as some you know, other you know, monitoring considerations and practical applications, they think this is a good recommendation to make. So when you're making these recommendations, you need to think in terms of what perspective are you using? So from a population perspective and patient perspective, some things are in common, like the desirable anticipated benefits and undesirable benefits. But then where things start differing is on things in terms of costs. From patients, out-of-pocket costs are important. From the population, it's not only out-of-pocket costs, but what resources and cost effectiveness. From a population perspective, there are other considerations like equity and acceptability and feasibility, which will differ from individual to individual. So the perspective you're taking needs also to be spread out. Okay, so I've summarized the entire process, and now we are going to do one more step. What happens if you're going to use a WHO guideline to see what you want to do in your own practice? So what happens there is the Systematic reviews give you judgments about the impact of whatever your policies might be. But you also need to factor in your local evidence. What are the judgments about the modifying factors, your needs, alternatives, resources, values? And the two together give you an overall set of judgments about the expected harms and benefits and opportunity costs of the policy you will adopt in your place. And then there are the judgments about trade-offs of the desirable impacts or the undesirable impacts, which help you to frame a good health policy. So the government of Ghana, some years ago, was updating their essential medicine list. And they were concerned because they tend to use quinine to treat severe false superior malaria in children. And by then, WHO had come up with another strong recommendation based on high quality evidence that artisanate IV should be used in preference to quinine even in children, based on an updated systematic review which showed that it reduces the risk of diet, death, high quality evidence, lower risk of hypoglycemia, high quality evidence, and moderate quality evidence of no difference in neurological symptoms. 
So what the government did was they spoke to the WHO and the WHO sent them this gentleman called Dave Sinclair from the Cochrane Infectious Group, Diseases Group, who had helped do this review, who also helped this guideline group locally, look at their local evidence along with the global evidence, and finally arrived at a published policy which said that although we are going to include artisanate in our essential medicine list, we will, for the moment, use quinine in preference to artisanate. Because we know that artisanate may be better to, than quinine, but quinine is also effective. And quinine is cheap, and it's easily available, whereas artisanate is a lot more expensive. And if we want to pay for artisanate from our health budget, then lots of other things will be left on. We won't be able to pay for and these opportunity costs will cause a lot of bad outcomes for other people. And moreover, we don't make artisan, so it's very difficult to ensure continued procurement. So until things change, we will use green. So this is an example of an evidence-informed decision using local contextual factors. There are some resources you may find useful. We've helped the government of India do the index TB guidelines, which is for Indian guidelines for extra primary tuberculosis, which uses a very structured grade process. It's worth reading this because it gives you an idea as to from A to Z on how to go about making a guideline. And Matthew, Joseph, Matthew, and I have been helping the Christian Medical College to come up with India specific COVID guidelines. And there are a whole lot of interventions for which the explicit process which went into making the recommendation are presented. You could take a look at that as well. If you want to know more about how to do systematic reviews, the Cochrane Handbook is available online, which is very, very detailed. And if you go to the Great Pro GDT website, there are a lot of resources you could use. For example, the Great Handbook is there. It's very detailed. You can even down print the PDF copy of the handbook. You can find references to many other articles published by great authors about the whole process. You can look at the database of grade evidence to decision-making ones that they have actually recently published and look at the guidelines developed with the grade pro GDT and also download the check with checklist of the guidelines international network and McMaster University. So lots of resources that you can put. Thank you very much and I hope this was an interesting start to the rest of the session. I can answer questions at the end or you could write to me at pratap.gmail.com. Thank you and be safe. Thank you very much, Prof. Tarian, for that very informative lecture, explaining grade, uh, how to use grade, uh, um, uh, uh, grade procedure in deciding uh, on uh, like using uh, when we use evidence to make our decisions that's very important for Sri Lanka as well and you specially highlighted like I mean we need to uh, consider the country's economy or cost effectiveness of all the evidence as well uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, there should be questions from the audience, but we will take them at the end of the talk, uh, uh, at the end of the symposium, and we are going to move on to the second talk of the uh, symposium. Uh, the second speaker is Professor Joseph Matthew, who is a professor in pediatric pulmonology at the PGIM Chandiga, India. And he's currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the Guidelines International Network. He's also the chair of the Guidelines International Network for Low Middle Income Countries uh, Working Group. And he's also a founding member of the South Asian Cochrane Network Center. Professor Matthew is going to talk on evidence-based guideline development and implementation. Over to you, Professor Matthew. Good morning. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate the University of Kelenea Faculty of Medicine on your 30th anniversary celebrations. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this. In particular, I thank my friend, Professor Krishanta Bisena, for including this panel in this particular prestigious occasion. Now, let me plunge straight into the topic. The topic given to us is to discuss evidence-based guideline development and implementation. <clears throat> 
And just by way of introduction, I'm a professor of pediatric pulmonology at the Advanced Pediatric Center at PGIMER Chandigarh, India. And I also chair the Guidelines International Network, Low and Middle Income Countries Working Group on Evidence-Based Guidelines. And at the back of uh, this presentation, you can see the logo of my institution. Now, I propose to do this presentation in the broad outline of discussing what is an evidence-based guideline, how we develop evidence-based guidelines, and then briefly touch upon the implementation of evidence-based guidelines. Now, coming to what exactly is an evidence-based guideline. Now, paradoxically, I couldn't find a single definition which covered all the points that should be there. So I've tried to make a single definition out of three separate statements from three important documents. The first is from a 1992 Institute of Medicine IOM report, which said that guidelines are systematically developed statements, et cetera, et cetera. And the key phrase that I'd like you to latch on in this particular slide is that they are systematically developed statements. Another document said that policy practice guidelines are basically systematic developed statements based on the best evidence. So from this particular definition, I'd like to pick up this phrase of being the best evidence. So in short, guidelines are systematically developed statements or documents based on the best evidence. And that is where they develop radically or they differentiate radically from what are called consensus statements or position papers. We're all familiar with consensus statements, which are basically the collective opinions or suggestions or views of a panel of experts. And a position paper is basically just a statement or a document which advocates a certain course of action. Now, how these two documents that we're familiar with, this differs from a practice guideline or a standard is that the guidelines are usually based on the highest level of evidence support, whereas position papers and consensus statements are not based on evidence at all, or usually the lowest level of evidence. Now, to make this definition complete, I'm also going to lean back on a picture like this. And that is most consensus statements are basically the voice of one or two dominant individuals in the room who then carry the decision of the whole group forward. And the consensus is not so much a positive consensus as it is absence of a dissent. We're all familiar with this. I think we've sat in many meetings like this, wherein one or two individuals dominate the whole thing. And if nobody dissents or opposes actively, that is taken as a consensus. Now, the complete definition of a guideline could be by adding this particular statement definition from the WHO's handbook, wherein a guideline is defined by the WHO as any document which contains recommendations. So therefore, a complete definition of an evidence-based guideline would be a systematically developed document or statement based on the best level of evidence possible, which contains recommendations for practice and use. And recommendations is important because it is the key product of a guideline document. So no guideline document is complete unless it has within it one or more evidence-based recommendation statements. And these recommendation statements are basically statements which decide to tell the intended guideline user what he or she could do or should do in specific situations, and also equally important what he or she should not or could not do. And more important, evidence-based guideline recommendations often have the offer of a choice between the different interventions so that end users can decide to choose options one between one or more of what is feasible and ultimately it is all to make a positive impact on health and the best utilization of the resources which are available so i hope that pretty much summarizes what an evidence-based guideline is all about because i plan now to switch gears a little bit and go into the development of an evidence-based guideline document or a statement Basically, a guideline document is a systematic process, as I explained, and there are 12 sub-steps of this whole development process, which I will touch upon briefly, and together that should comprise how and why we develop the evidence-based guideline document. Now, the very first thing for a guideline development group to consider is if a guideline is required at all in the first place. And I think who wants the guideline versus who needs the guideline should be sorted out before the guideline development process is begun because they are often not the same. You know, institutions, agencies, uh, professional societies want to develop guidelines, but we need to explore whether it is actually needed in the sense of whether the burden of the disease, the options which are available, the need for guidance really warrants the development of a guideline in the first place or not. And if a guideline is required, 
we then need to explore if a guideline already exists, even if it's for a different setting, and there are barriers to using the existing guideline, and then ponder very deeply on whether or not a new guideline should be formulated at all. Because this is a time consuming, resource intensive process, and therefore one needs to get into it when one is totally clear that a guideline is indeed required. The second step is to form a steering group and a steering group, of course, is going to be the oversight group, which provides admin support and key decision making for all of this. But the main roles of the steering group are to draft the scope of the guideline and formulate the key questions which will be addressed in and within that guideline. And then, of course, to identify the people who should be in that guideline development group, including content experts and methodology experts, because there would be systematic reviews and guideline development process involved. This key group actually oversees the process of evidence search, retrieval, evidence assessment, appraisal, and synthesis. In other words, the whole body of the guideline is dependent on this group. They also select the members of the group, like I said, and also the external review group who will review the document before it's disseminated. Another important role of the steering group is to collect and assess declarations of interest of each member in the guideline panel and also to manage conflicts if there are any, and we'll touch upon these subsequently. Guideline development group meetings are organized by them. Draft recommendations are done done by this group. And ultimately the draft guideline document is formulated by this group, and then ultimately it is sent out for peer review. So the steering group is a very key important body who has a great stake in the process of guideline development right from the beginning, right through to its end point. The third important step is for this group to draft and write down neatly and precisely the scope and purpose of the guideline itself. So every guideline should have an overall objective. This may be one or multiple that covers the health questions which are going to be addressed in that particular guideline. Identify and define the stakeholders a guideline is meant for, whether it is for professionals, whether it is for the public, mixture of both or policymakers, etc. And also briefly discuss and touch upon what that guideline is expected to achieve in the short term and in the long run. And the fourth important step is to have a guideline development group. And some of the work of the guideline development group is to assist that steering group in formulating the key questions. Because a guideline is ultimately going to be a set of answers to the key questions which have been posed by this group. And for each of these key questions, there are one or more outcomes which can be used to measure the success or failure of that intervention. The choosing and ranking and prioritizing those outcomes is part of this group. Then, of course, the guideline development group has to access the evidence, examine it carefully, appraise the quality of the evidence, interpret it, and ultimately help the steering group to formulate recommendations. So a key question which often comes up is, who should be in that guideline development group? And this slide also shows that. A guideline development panel should contain technical experts who are familiar with the content and the expertise. It should certainly have end users who will be implementing that guideline. And that might include physicians, healthcare professionals, whether it is nursing professionals, allied health professionals, and often members of the public or patients themselves, or representatives of patient advocacy groups, because the guideline will be implemented on them and by them. Of course, it is important to have experts who are content or methodology experts who can assess evidence, help in the development of the guidelines through a structured process. So guideline development group should include these people as well. Then step five is to have declarations of interest and the management of conflicts of interest. Now, an interest is any kind of a thing which can affect the independent judgment of a person in the guideline development group. It could be a positive impact or it could be a negative impact. It could be a financial impact or a non-financial impact. So anything actually can be broadly classified as a declaration of interest. So it's important for each and every member in the panel to declare what their interests are and for the steering group to actually see if there are any conflicts of interest. Now, conflict of interest can be broadly defined as you know, any kind of a situation or circumstances that creates the possibility that the professional judgment or actions regarding the primary interest, which is to develop an evidence-based guideline, could be unduly influenced by a secondary interest, which could be a professional interest, an academic interest, a financial interest, an interest of some other institution or agency, especially one has wearing multiple hats. The World Health Organization simplifies this definition as any interest which is declared by a member in the group, which can affect or be perceived to affect. It's not that the individual himself decides whether or not he has an interest, 
it can be perceived to affect that individual's objectivity and independence in providing inputs to that guideline panel or group. So what is usually done is every member should fill a standard form, which is called a declaration of interest form. And then, then the steering group looks for conflicts of interest to judge if there are anything which can impact the independence of this person in that particular group. Then, of course, the next key step is to formulate questions or which need to be addressed through the guideline. And there is this famous PICO format, which stands for P for the population of the patient or the problem, I for interventions or exposures, C for what this is being compared against, and O for outcome. So this PICO is actually the brick on which everything in evidence-based healthcare is dependent on. And these days, we add a couple of other letters to the acronym T for the time frame in which those outcomes are measured, and C is, S is for the healthcare setting. In other words, PICOT's questions are what the guideline is going to seek to answer and address and formulate recommendations on. Once these PICOT questions are in place, the next important step is to actually do a systematic review of literature to gather the evidence for each of those PICOT questions. And a systematic review by way of a simple definition is a detailed literature review on clearly formulated questions, which are these PICOT questions, using systematic and explicit methods to prevent the creeping in of bias in the identification, selection, critical appraisal of research, and then finally extracting the data and doing analysis to get the data that we need from these systematic reviews. The eighth step, once you have the systematic review in place and the evidence in hand, is to judge the quality of the evidence. Now, evidence quality is to be judged at three levels. One is each individual study that is part of the systematic review has to be appraised for methodological quality. Each outcome that is being addressed through a bunch of studies, the quality has to be appraised across those studies. And finally, for multiple outcomes, the quality has to be appraised across those outcomes it will be important to formulate a recommendation statement. Now, what is meant by this term quality? Quality actually is a surrogate for the term risk of bias. Bias, we know in uh, healthcare or in evidence-based practices, anything which leads a person away from the truth. So risk of bias means anything which can reduce our confidence in the estimates of effect or confidence in the veracity or truthfulness or confidence in the precision Anything which reduces confidence in the estimates of effect of associations reported in systematic reviews can be called risk of bias. And the idea of doing a quality appraisal is to see how this bias is going to impact on the recommendations which are going to be formulated. It is practical that sometimes we don't have the best quality of evidence that is totally free from bias. There would be certain biases creeping in, and we need to judge how that might impact the recommendation statements that are going to be developed by this particular guideline development group. The ninth step is once you have the evidence in place and it has been appraised is to formulate recommendations. Recommendations are actionable statements which tell the users in precise terms what can or should be done. So there is a direction of the recommendation statement which is do this or don't do this, a positive recommendation or a negative recommendation, and then a strength of the recommendation statement. By strength, we mean that what would be the positive effects if the recommendation statement were implemented versus what could be the undesirable or negative consequences and what is the balance between these. Usually the positive effects include things like better healthcare management, better efficacy outcomes, maybe sometimes enhanced safety of patients, etc. And the undesirable uh, consequences could be increased costs, additional resources which are required or additional training of the healthcare personnel, etc. So a clear balance has to be struck between these. And to help doing this is where Professor Pratap Therian's evidence to decision framework or those tables come in handy, which was presented in the previous lecture. So ultimately we have a recommendation which is either strong or weak. Strong recommendations are those which are couched in terms like do this, don't do this. Weak or conditional recommendations will say may do this, can do this, or could be considered and things like that. Once we have those recommendations in place, now the guideline development group has to draft the document itself. And a guideline document usually has three parts, an executive summary, which is basically a summary of everything which is there and a summary of the key recommendations. Then the main body of the document, which includes the contents, introduction, methods, the results of the entire systematic review, which may be one or multiple, the ratings of the outcomes, summary of findings, tables, 
and the evidence to decision tables, which we discussed in the previous presentation. The recommendations are, of course, discussed at great length. The conclusions, which may be one or many, can come up. And then at the end of this, we have a section in which the role names of the participants, their roles, affiliations, conflicts of interest are all declared and disclosed, and then a list of references. If the entire systematic review cannot be pushed into the main body of the document, it could as well be put in the appendix section of the document. And so a guideline development document might run into several pages, sometimes into including hundreds of pages. And these appendices may or may not be part of the main document itself. Then the next step is to have an external peer review of the guideline document once it is ready. And a draft, draft document with the recommendations is circulated for review both to content experts who are not part of the group and maybe even for public viewing, which is often done by the World Health Organization. The process of the review and the way the responses are handled should be clearly specified. And this external review technically can be done at multiple stages. It doesn't have to be necessarily done only at the end of the whole process. It could be done right from the planning stages, from the stage of systematic review of literature, and it could also be done midway through the whole process just to make sure that everything is neat and tidy. And then when the guideline document is ready, the last step is to publish and disseminate it widely. So before publication, there is the steps of writing it, editing, proofreading, formatting, and things like that. Dissemination basically involves, you know, making it available to the end users through wide either spread through the internet or through publications or through online uh, ways of doing it and not just making it available, but also accessible at the point of care to the end users who need to use those guidelines. Often professional healthcare societies will advertise this guideline so that it can be disseminated more widely. And then lastly, no guideline is complete unless there is a clear plan for updating it because guidelines are based on best quality evidence. Evidence have a shelf life. When new evidence comes in, the guideline might need to be updated or the recommendations reformulated. So the, the date of updating depends on how fast the research on the subject is evolving. With COVID guidelines have been updated every few months, the tuberculosis maybe every few years, and some guidelines may not really change for years together. If there are new questions for which new evidence might be required to be found, that would be an indication to update a guideline. And when there is a need for new advice, either because of the end user's needs or the healthcare system's needs, that too would be an indication to update the guideline. Now, in summary, therefore, the whole guideline development process can be summarized into 12 steps, which I've tried to highlight in this particular slide. Since the recording is going to be available, I'm not going to read through these 12 steps again. I'm again going to switch gears to touch upon very briefly on implementation of evidence-based guidelines, because no guideline is complete if the gap remains between development and implementation. That would be like having a beautiful flyover under construction, and then we leave it midway. So all the effort which has gone up to building it up to this stage is gone waste until we can have the rest of the thing done as well. And to implement guidelines, we basically need to look at recommendations which are already existing. If we did a de novo recommendation process of development, then the thing to see is if the end users can directly adopt those recommendations, that is the process of adopting. The, the common term could be copy and pasting, which means you take up those recommendations and straight away copy paste them in your own healthcare setting. If they cannot be adopted directly, there is a scope of adapting certain guideline recommendations, which is like a nip and tuck procedure in which the main guideline recommendations remain in place, but we need to tweak them a little bit to make them utilizable for our own individual healthcare setting. That would be called adaptation process. And it's only when neither adoption nor adaptation seems to work that we need to develop entirely new recommendations through the 12 step process that I mentioned, and that would be akin to reinventing the wheel. So the key thing is reinventing the wheel can be very exciting, but can also be very time consuming, fraught with dangers of expenses and things. And it could also be such that it is overwhelming and like this inventor of the wheel got crushed by it, guideline panel can be bogged down really by the process of developing recommendations from scratch, which are applicable to the local setting. But that of course would be the best way forward. And then finally, we should remember that not always do we need to develop guidelines or recommendations de novo. We can look at existing globally available guidelines and recommendations. The key thing to remember is no guideline or guideline recommendation is a one-size-fits-all kind of an approach. 
So there would be a lot of evidence, there would be a lot of guidelines, there would be a lot of recommendations which are available. We need to see which shoe fits best for the healthcare system that we are dealing with. It's impossible to tailor make each and every healthcare system's guidelines or recommendations. So the best fit approach might be useful. And that includes a judicious process of adopting, adapting, developing. And these days we use the phrase development of guideline recommendations from different healthcare contexts into the local healthcare setting. So I hope that in these 20 minutes, I have been able to provide a brief overview of what a guideline or an evidence-based guideline actually is, how these evidence-based guideline documents are developed, and finally, of course, a few clues on how to implement these guidelines. On that note, thank you very much to each of you and wish you an excellent celebrations on the 30th anniversary occasion of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Kalanaya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor uh, Matthews, for that excellent talk. Thank you for enlightening us on the 12 steps in developing a guideline and the basics of implementing guidelines. Uh, now we are going to move on to the third talk. Uh, the, the third talk will be delivered by Professor Krishanta Besena, who is well known to our audience. Uh, he's the, uh, he is one of the senior professors in the Department of Community Medicine, senior professor in community medicine in the Department of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalanir. He is the incumbent director of the Postgraduate Institute of Indigenous Medicine and he has served as the deputy director of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo as well. He is also a founder member of the South Asian Cochrane Network and he is also a member of the Guidelines International Network. So, Professor Abesena is going to talk on adaptation of clinical practice guidelines. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Chamila. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Pratap Tarian and Professor Joseph Matthew for accepting uh, our invitation. Uh, also, I want to thank the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and the Organizing Organization Committee uh, to uh, give an opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, uh, guideline development. So my topic is adaptation of clinical practice guidelines. So what is the, the, the definition of adaptation? That is a systematic process that guides local groups to identify evaluate, adapt, and use already available uh, guidelines for their own purpose. Another definition, according to another definition, it is a systematic process approach to considering the use and or modification of guidelines, producing one cultural and organizational setting for application in a different context. So guideline can be adapted uh, in a different field, health promotion, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and other intervention in this area. So basically, uh, our guideline, guideline adaptation process, there are three phase, uh, phases, set of phase, adaptation phase, and finalization, finalization phase, including uh, 24 steps. So the, my presentation is based on this guideline adaptation and resource toolkit. You can download this. Uh, the phase one set of phase, uh, first is establishment and an organization committee that is, and also the multidisciplinary panel. Se uh, second, uh, select, select a guideline topic that is uh, simple. Then third, check whether the ad ad adaptation is feasible. If there are no evidence-based guidelines available, we can't adapt. So therefore, first we have to check uh, from a uh, guideline develop organization, for example, NICE sign. Then fourth step is uh, identify necessary resources and skills. What are the ne necessary resources? One is commitment, that is very important, and also the cost and the administration functions. Then what are the skills? One is uh, clinical knowledge on the topic area. So that is, so I think uh, this is related to the guideline development panel. Clinical knowledge in the topic area, personal experience with the topic area, 
that means patient views, patient preferences, characteristics. Then policy and administrative expertise, uh, methodological expertise on guideline development and critical appraisal, uh, interpretation of evidence, uh, grade approach, information retrieval ex expertise, implementation expertise. The next step is complete the task for the setup phase, that is, we have to decide the terms of reference, scope of the work, membership of the guideline panel, meeting plan, declaration of uh, conflicts of interest, consensus proce process, how the panel will manage the decisions, then the guideline authorship, potential endorsement bo bodies, for example, SLMA or a college or the directorate of uh, quality uh, improvement in the ministry, uh, and then the dissemination and implementation strategies. Then the sixth step is write adaptation plan. So each decision taken by the organization committee and the multidisciplinary planner should be well documented to make the process transparent. So the adaptation plan including the scope of topic and the health questions, terms of reference, funding and uh, resource commitments, consensus process, conflicts of interest, projected timeline, and meeting arrangements. The next step is uh, determine the health question. So we, you, we can use PICO or uh, same, same thing, uh, population intervention or the exposure, professionals to whom the guideline will be targeted, then the outcomes. Again, the patient outcomes, we talk about critical outcomes, uh, again, public health outcomes or system related outcomes. And also the, finally, healthcare setting and the context. We are going to apply this uh, outcome. The, then the, uh, this is an example, patient population, average risk women, investigation screening, professionals, family physicians or GP or MOH, uh, MOH outcome screening interval, health care setting, family practice, or well women clinic. Then next step is search for guidelines and other documents. So we need a prior research strategy. So we, we have to decide inclusion exclusion criteria. For example, they were developing organization based on developing, for, for example, nice guidelines, or date of publication, posting, or release country, or language of publication or dates of search used by the uh, source guideline developers. And also identify any other relevant documents such as systematic reviews or health technology assessment reports. Next step is uh, screen retrieved guidelines. Again, we need uh, strategy uh, according to our uh, uh, questions we raise. Then next, Reduce large number of retrieved guidelines if there are more. So we can select one guideline or we can use several guidelines. Then we have to reduce the guideline based on the criteria, basically quality. So we have to uh, critically appraise those guidelines. Then the assessing guideline quality, we use uh, AGRI instrument, AGRI 2 instrument. So then from there, uh, we can summarize and give the agree score. So again, uh, you can download this agree instrument. Uh, so it has six domains, scope and purpose, stakeholder involvement, regard of development, clarity and presentation, applicability and editorial independence. So it has 23 items. And then we can calculate the overall uh, scope. Then next step is uh, assess guideline currency. So what is currency? Is there any evidence relevant to the guideline? New evidence relevant to the guideline, so whether it is outdated. Does new evidence invalidate any of the recommendations? Are there any plans to update the guideline in the near future or when was the guideline was updated? So guideline is out out of date, then we have to conduct a rapid review of literature or the systematic review, search for systematic reviews, then contact guideline developer for further information and contact, uh, contact expert in the field. 
Then third, uh, next step is assess the guideline content. Uh, we, we can use, uh, to assess the content, use uh, recommenda recommendations matrix. So I will show you. Uh, there are different methods of recommendation matrix. Again, uh, so the columns is the guidelines, guideline one, two, three. And then uh, the matrix is uh, title, publication year, agree scope, uh, strength and limitations, uh, health question addressed, then uh, specific recommend recommendations, level of evidence, those are the content. Then next step is assess the guideline consistency. What is consistency? Consistency between the selected, uh, selected evidence and the interpretations. And also the consistency between the interpretation and the recommendations. So this should include assessing relevance, relevance of the, guide, uh, the evidence, relevance and exhaustiveness of the database searched and criteria to use the select references and how many references they used. The consistency, uh, so the, what is evidence-based guideline that consists of evidence generated via the systematic review on which the source guideline is based. Second, interpretation of that evidence within the healthcare context and the developer's experience. Third, guideline recommendations that make into account of the local situation and values. So, and, uh, so when we assess consistency, we have to assess the clinical relevance of the primary studies, clinical trials, clinical and methodological heterogeneity of the studies reported, level of evidence adequately described, level of evidence attributed to the recommendation justified, uh, and patients and interventions in the studies analyzed judged to be scientifically comparable to those targeted by the recommendations, and balance between the risk and benefits being correctly taken into consideration, and the formal process used to define the recommendation, that is the grade approach. Then next is assess the acceptability and applicability of the recommendations, that is one aspect is availability of the health services, expertise, resources and equipment in our set of, setting. Uh, that is related to the health service. Then what are the other barriers to implementation, legislation, and other policies? Then second is population characteristics, cultural beliefs, values, those things. Then uh, next step is review assessments, inform and transparent decision making uh, around the selection and in modification of the source guideline. This is very important, transparent. So we can use the agri score also and the uh, recommendation matrix. Then the next is decision and selection process. So one is accept the whole guideline and all, the, all its recommendations. That is one uh, option. Second, reject the whole, guide, uh, whole guideline. That is the panel decides reject the complete guideline. The decision will be based on the, how the panel weights the assessment based on the agree uh, scope. Third, accept the evidence summary of the guidelines, but the panel decides to accept the description of the evidence or parts of the evidence, but to reject the interpretation and the recommendations. Fourth option, uh, accept single recommendations. That is, the guideline panel decides which to accept and which to reject, which may be from one or more guidelines. Uh, next is modified signal recommendations. After reviewing all the recommendations from the guidelines, the panel decides which, which are the acceptable and need to be modified. Then step 18, prepare draft adapted guideline. It should be transparent. And, and so this is the uh, prepared draft ad adapted guideline uh, introduction and background. Uh, scope and purpose, target audience, target population, health questions addressed, recommendations, supporting evidence and information for the recommendation. The next step is the review, external review and consultation, those other, other steps. So the external review by target users of the guideline, that is very important, who are the target uh, users, any practitioner who would use the guideline. 
clinicians, policy makers, decision makers, and others. Again, the, uh, different questions might need to be addressed for each group. The questions ask whether users approve the draft guideline, what is, uh, what is its uh, strength and recommend uh, weaknesses, uh, uh, what require modification, whether they would use the guideline in, the, in their practice, how it would impact or change their current practice or routines, confidence of the adaptation process, the acceptability of the guideline for the organization, and the resource implications. Next step is consultation with the endorsement bodies. So there are two form, simple recognition or the formal recognition. So we can send it to SLMA or a college to enhance acceptability. Then the consultation with source guideline developers. So the, uh, we can send the guideline to the guideline developers uh, whose recommendations have been used in the draft, guide, draft di guideline, particularly in the case where changes have been made to the original recommendation. Then uh, next step is acknowledgement source, evidence, uh, source documents, all the documents used to use in the creation of the draft, uh, draft guideline should be referred. And also, uh, the, whether they need to seek permission to use any guideline or guideline recommendation using the adapted guideline. And also, the information uh, should be available as part of the guideline document under the copyright clause. Then next step is plan, schedule, review and update the uh, adopted guideline. So we have to review, I think we discussed earlier in the sessions, uh, because things change, evidence changes, outcome changes, technology changes, healthcare setting changes, changes in the existing benefits and harms, changes in values related to the outcome, uh, and also review date should be decided upon along with the process of dealing with the reviewing the updated guideline. Then uh, final step is uh, produce final guideline document. The final guideline product should be easily accessible, clear, and un unambiguous. So we can use algorithm or care pathways or checklist, and also patient information materials are desirable. Again, this is the summary. Uh, identify uh, identify uh, a clinical area to promote best practice, then establish an interdisciplinary and guideline evaluation panel, uh, then establish guideline appraisal process, search and retrieve guidelines, assess the guideline quality, currency, content, and acceptability, then adaptation of the guideline for local use, then external review, final guideline, fi finalized local guidelines, official endorsement, and adaptation of local guidelines, schedule review. This is also the same. Okay. Then I would like to uh, spend one minute uh, for uh, the can implement uh, is a software process. Uh, so it has three phases, phase one, two, three, for guideline adaptation and implementation planning. So this is the uh, can implement uh, program, uh, phase one uh, here. Uh, usually uh, be, uh, at a guideline adaptation, then phase two, planning for implementation, then phase three, uh, monitoring, implementation and monitoring. So this is phase one, again, the same uh, steps are there, uh, different version, that, that is the different, even you can use, you can download this, and you can use this for guideline adaptation. Uh, lastly, the the guideline ad adaptation respect to evidence-based principles of guideline development, reliable and consistent method to ensure the quality of adapted guideline, participative approach involving all key stakeholders to foster acceptance and ownership of the adapted guideline, Ex explicit consideration of the context during adaptation to ensure relevance, re relevance for the local practice, transparent reporting to promote confidence in the re recommendation of the adapted guideline, flexible format for accommodate specific needs and circumstances, accountability to primary guideline sources. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Professor Abbe Sena, for that very extensive lecture on like how to uh, adapt guidelines to our healthcare system. So now the forum is open for questions. Uh, you can send in your questions through the chat box. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, Until we get, a quest uh, get questions to the chat box, can I start with uh, a question? Right. Uh, I would like to pose this question to all three speakers. Um, actually, this is a practical problem that we face. So recently, the Ministry of Health and the Ceylon College of Physicians started to develop a guideline for the, uh, on hyperlipidemia management for local setup, the primary health care doctors and for the secondary health care. And there the problem we uh, faced was like, so there are three new guidelines, the NICE guideline, the European one and the American one. So which guideline to adopt was the first problem. So actually when going, uh, uh, going by the guidelines, like all three guidelines were saying the same thing. What they said was like high, if somebody is at high risk, start them on statins. But the uh, problem we faced was like the three guidelines used three different ways of detecting high risk people. So the nice one, they say like even for diabetics, we have to restratify them and depending on the risk to start on statins, whereas the European one says, like if somebody is diabetic, start, they are always at high risk, so start them on statins. So that's where the problem we had. Uh, I would like to have your opinion as to like what would we have done. And uh, Yes, yeah. uh, I think better to uh, give the opportunity to uh, answer yes. Professor Yes, Professor uh, Matthew. Matthew. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, this is a common problem because in the developing world, we often wonder which developed country guideline we can uh, take, tweak, and then use. But I think before we did that, the first thing would be to figure out what are the questions that need answers in the Sri Lankan context, in your primary healthcare setup or whatever you mentioned, which are the issues which need addressing in that, in that context. And once we have those questions clear, preferably in the PICOT format that we talked about, then we can start looking at literature and see if there are guidelines which already provide answers to the same or similar questions. Because we should remember that the guidelines developed for another setting might not be addressing the questions that you are interested in, even though the broad topic is management of dyslipidemia or community-based management of um, high cholesterol or whatever. If there are guidelines whose recommendations are addressing the same picot questions that you need to do, that is when you can decide to choose either adoption by going through the steps which Professor Tarian so nicely said, looking at the risks, the benefits, the resource implications, what would happen if you did this, what would happen if you didn't do this. There are nine or 10 criteria in the great checklist which you could go, sift through in a meeting, and then decide upon whether or not that can be used as it is. If not, then the second surrogate is to fall back upon the adaptation process that Professor Krishanta outlined so nicely. And that is what modifications would be needed in, your, in, in that particular guideline recommendation to make it usable in your own setting. And if neither works, then of course the last option is to start developing a de novo guideline based on the fact that nothing in the existing literature is usable in your own setting and context. I know it's not a very helpful answer, but that is the way of um, going about it. I defer to Professor Tarian on this now. Well, I, I agree with what Joseph said, but very specific to your question, I would first ask the panel who is involved in looking at this, what is the issue that you really find contentious? Is it that you want more evidence on treating diabetes in Asian populations with statins? And if that's the question, frame what these questions are, and look to see whether the guidelines themselves give you the evidence for making that recommendation, or look for a systematic review or trial that you might have to see specifically what is the contentious issue and have the guidelines provided sufficient evidence involving 
uh, patients from the setting you're interested in and the considerations of whether uh, if that's not specifically there, can it be generalized? So there are processes by which you see how do you generalize from one setting to the other? And then use that process to ask yourself, it's not apparent very clearly in the guideline, but they have given us evidence or they haven't given us evidence. If they haven't given us evidence, a tough job is to actually, and it'll probably be a very useful exercise for people in developing countries to get this answer. Are those recommendations specific for people living in different settings, less developed countries, more resource constrained countries, things of that sort? And then the rest of this process follows what Joseph said. Thank you very much, Professor Tarian and Professor Matthews. Yeah, that, that uh, uh, gave us a very good explanation as to what we should be doing. Actually, we didn't know the exact, uh, the technical bits behind that, but then actually, uh, the main reason why we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, what we wanted was like to adapt the guidelines uh, to match our uh, economy as well, like the healthcare budget. So like, I mean, uh, so uh, because of that, so what we decided on was like, since we don't want to give, like we can't afford to give statins to all diabetics in Sri Lanka. So like the, the cost effectiveness and uh, uh, the health economics, everything matters. So that like the NICE guideline is a cost effective and they go for cost effective uh, management. So actually we went, for NICE, went to adopt uh, um, NICE guidelines because like they restratify and give statins only to the high risk people. But thank you for explaining the uh, actual technical uh, uh, background behind that. And then I, uh, fr from... No, I think uh, the Ministry of Health uh, already developed guidelines in 2007, I think 94 guidelines. Uh, I think colleges uh, developed for the ministry. Yeah. I think uh, we assess those guidelines based on agri criteria. I think there are so many problems in those guidelines. I think those guidelines are copy and paste guidelines. So that is not adaptation. So for the adaptation process, it will take about that at least six months to adapt, yes. to, to develop guidelines, maybe one, two years. Yes. So uh, there should be a, a multidisciplinary panel to uh, yes. develop all the adapt guidelines. Yes. One, I think. Uh, yeah, actually, this started in 2018, still going on, still not so like uh, 2007. After that, now it started to develop in 2018, still going on. It's the uh, NCD unit of the ministry. So there are community physicians there. So now they are like, yeah. I think they're going through that uh, agree and all those, I guess. Like, so mm -hmm. it's the we were the content specialists, but we the, the the process and the technical experts were from the ministry and community physicians but still not out like so yeah. that is what is being discussed mm -hmm. and uh, another question in uh, may i would like to pose it to um, prof Krishant. Uh, this is about now so now the the final agreement of the content experts was to like i mean go for like nice guidelines and probably adapt it to Sri Lankan settings. Uh, the other question again, uh, one question in adapting is like, I mean, so we say that all the nice guidelines, they go for Q-risk, whereas here in Sri Lanka, the whatever, at least the one that matches us is the WHO one. So uh, that is the other uh, issue we are facing. And how do you uh, like, uh, how can you like uh, help us? Like, I mean, yeah, explain I think, that. Uh, first we have to de uh, decide our question. What is the problem we have? So, and also uh, from that point, we have to start. Then based on our question, uh, then we have to uh, go forward according to these steps. I think uh, we need to like, I mean, so that question again, need to go through all yeah. those steps that you explained and then we need to come to a final decision. Thank you very much. That was very uh, helpful. And I think it's a very uh, informative and a uh, fruitful symposium. Um,
in the interest of time, like if there are no any other questions, shall we wind up the session? Um, right, so that brings to the end of a very successful uh, uh, symposium on a like very specialized topic. And I would like to thank all three speakers, Professor Tharian and Professor Matthews, who uh, like uh, took uh, their valuable time, like spent their valuable time in uh, addressing our questions. And uh, thank you very much for um, sharing your experience with us. And I would like to thank Prashant Krishant Abhesena for organizing this and bringing down these uh, eminent speakers for this uh, symposium. Um, as a, um, I would like to call upon uh, Professor Anuradhani Katsuri to hand over the token of appreciation, uh, the certificate of appreciation to Professor uh, Krishant Abhesena, but. Uh, uh, online uh, resource persons, uh, we will be sending e certificates to our uh, to Professor Tharian and Professor Matthews. Thank you very much uh, for joining.